Hello, I'm the Angry Spork, still taking issue with Batman and Robin Eternal. Previously, Spiral Agent Grayson and Bluebird encountered Sculptor, a psychic that used to work for Mother, who decided to show Cassie's terrible new origin to Harper, because Ro is the only real important factor in another character's existence. Sculptor then showed Grayson how Batman not only agreed to let Mother mold for him a better Robin, but that he would kill the child's parents himself to prove his loyalty. When the woman vanishes because she just can't help them anymore, due to ambiguity, I suppose, we glimpse the nursery housing Mother's latest generation of children, all dead, and then we glimpse a blood-covered Cassandra Kane. Issue 13's cover features Cassie with bat-shaped blood on her face because blood is just so edgy and cool! Script by James Tinney IV, we begin with an Argus surveillance shuttle where two agents are observing a former diamond mine turned toxic gas-spewing maw, the Scar. Hmm. A place that was once the source for something people would find valuable now turned into something sickeningly terrible. Where have we seen that before? One agent, Mitch, is curious why their flight plan has them passing by a site that won't be habitable for another two centuries. But his co-pilot notes she set the flight plan and not for this spot. They realize, despite scans and procedure, they have a stowaway when the airlock is opened, one that halo jumps before they can get a look at her. On a two-page spread, we see it's Cassie with some new gear, including goggles and a backpack, that opens to a curiously bat-looking pair of wings. I'd ask where and when she got that, but this is an eternal story, so why bother? Just like they'll never clarify how she survived going to an allegedly toxic environment. Is it really poisonous or an illusion? The deadliness of the chasm seems to have been exaggerated as she dives in, discards the pack before it explodes. For some reason, fires a grapnel line and swings into the nursery and its crazy upside-down architecture on another two-page spread while taking out a sentry gun before it can fire. We flash back to this title's favorite time period several years ago, where a younger Cass watches multiple children arrive into Mother's waiting embrace as a recording with an odd speech pattern instructs them on not crying and stair-ascending. The kids accept hugs from their new owner, when Kane catches his daughter, chiding her for sneaking off. You know you cannot speak to them! Why do you insist on playing these childish games? She's a child? Whale Orphan Boy thinks different as he holds her up by the neck, saying she's something much better and stronger than the others, and threatens her with a month in the black box without sound or light. As present Cassie fills with a fuse box and continues her trek, she recalls another time when she watched the children, this time led by hovering drones, the source of the separated syllables, and is caught again, this time by Sculptor. She says they've just recently started teaching her language, which has proven delicate, and Kane wouldn't like her interacting with other children, though the woman promises not to put her in the aforementioned black box, or let her dad know. Okay, so they made the point previously that she was not taught to speak, so that would better hone her fighting skills. Yet now they're saying they were trying to teach her language. <laughs> what does that mean? What language? Were they teaching her to read? To write? Or, or is this just some vague reversal trying to glaze over a screw-up on the part of the writers? Cass was curious about two kids hugging, and Sculptor says it's a sign of caring for one another, which Cassie mimics almost immediately. The psychic pushes her off, saying she should never do that again, as it's not what she was meant to be. Well, she also wasn't meant to be pointlessly rebooted under an idiot's mandate by a guy clearly more interested in showing off another character, but without all that pesky development. Yet here we are. Presently, a drone notices Cassandra, but she quickly attacks it on another two-page spread. Huh. Well, she activates helpful mode, and I guess those wires weren't important because it becomes, well, helpful. 
Cass gradually manages to ask where the children are, meaning her verbal repertoire is no longer limited to the title of a human trafficker. The bot leads her through the base, mentioning many children have returned lately, and they stop at a kind of medical room. For its trouble, the machine is bifurcated by Orphan, who has a shiny new robot hand, as he restrains his daughter to a chair, guessing she sought redemption by freeing the other kids. A circular trap door of sorts is opened, and Cassie is released, sliding down into a pit full of dead children. First, it seemed like a waste of panels to have Cassie manacled to a chair, only to be let go a couple seconds later. Orphan already managed to grab her, seems like he could have just held tight, opened the door, and thrown her in. Secondly, how do I put this? Tinian? WHAT IS WRONG WITH YOU?! WHAT IS YOUR FIXATION ON DEAD KIDS?! I mean, the previous David Gain wasn't exactly a saint, but this... This is just gratuitous dreck! Yeah, moving on. Cass seems to try slowing her descent by grabbing the wall, but leaves a trail of blood. So either that made her fingers bleed, or that blood was already on the walls from, you know, the dead kids. Either way, she's horrified. On... Another two-page spread, David insists he's not a cruel monster, he just really believes in the process of the woman that took him off the streets of Shanghai. As the girl grapnels out and darts into hiding, Kane goes on that she was intended to be proof that humans can be perfected. But since she ran off, it's all led to Kane having to exterminate every child. So a character who was white before the Flashpoint reboot is now Chinese. However you feel about something like that, it begs a question. How did he end up with a Hebraic name? Did he get it from his parents, or did Mother change it for some reason? Again with this series, don't expect an answer. Flashback several months ago, what a twist, taking place around the time of Scott Snyder's Endgame story. Cassie has somehow given Batman information on Mother, no, it's not explained how she informed him of the list of her children, but Bats realized the old foe is still alive, and is even surprised to see Cassandra again. So, maybe a later flashback will show them meeting again? Maybe? Anyway, the Dark Knight has to face the Joker alone, and isn't sure he'll survive, so he gives Cassie the Bat thumb drive from issue one to give to Dick Grayson. Just doesn't mention how to find him, or what he looks like, or <laughs> anything like that. He can tell she's afraid, but assures the girl that he understands how hurt she is by what she was made to do, but she can choose to be more than what she was made for. Her journey to give this info to him made her a hero, and a teary-eyed Cassie hugs him in thanks. Yeah, it's a sweet little scene. Too bad none of it is remotely earned. They've spent so much time rushing Cassie's new development, it doesn't have any of the impact as when her history was originally revealed. They want to try and call you back from the original stuff, but they want to try and do their own thing and try and mesh all together, but it doesn't work. Sometimes you cannot have it both ways, no matter how hard you try. As Cass draws a bat on her face in blood, Kane mentions that soon she and Batman's other allies will be as dead as he is. I guess he missed the part of the series where Bruce is still alive. Or does he plan on giving them all amnesia to be symbolically dead while cops in mech suits take over their roles? Doesn't matter, because on another two-page spread... Yeah, this is overdoing it, people. Cassie gets a surprise attack in until Grayson and Bluebird taser him into submission. Cass hugs Harper because she's been rebooted as having zero standards and friends, when Mother's head holographically appears. I am Mother, the great and powerful. Pay no attention to the convoluted story behind the curtain. She'd have liked Jason and Tim to be present, but she'll have to do with killing those within the nursery right now. She tells David that he did a good job and that she's proud of him, even the ones opposing her, pitying them rather than hating them, but can't afford weakness in her endeavors. Funny, she didn't seem too thrilled with Orphan's offspring, but whatever. She tells them of a thermonuclear device set to destroy the entire complex before signing off. I think we can all guess just how James Cena IV would want this to be resolved. The bomb meets Harper Row, 
instantly falls in love with her, despite being incapable of emotions, sight, or intelligence, and spends the rest of the series arguing with Tim Drake over who gets to be president of the Bluebird Fan Club. The cover of issue 14 teases a team-up between Bats and Scarecrow, which seems like the premise of Batman v Superman 2, Midday of Justice. Tinian's still scripting, and we open in Prague during Grayson's tenure as the Boy Wonder. He and Bats crash the Batmobile through the walls of a chemical plant, knocking around and potentially killing some guys in hazmat suits, then creating a smokescreen before going on a less vehicular offensive. After weeks of laying low, Scarecrow felt the dynamic duo were closing in, and has accelerated his plans. As they continue fighting, Professor Crane manages to contact only Batman's cowl comms, saying he wants to talk about Mother. He instructs to have Robin disable a bomb at the top of the building, or people will die. Bats follows through, while telling his sidekick that any feelings of not being told something are in his head. Hey, remember when you two had that huge argument that insinuated you'd be parting ways? How'd you go and patch that up? I mean, don't get me wrong, I never really suspected that moment to have much permanence in the story, but they went to the trouble of showing it, so it feels kind of disjointed if they don't bother showing how they reconciled to this point. Present day, Harper feels obligated to spaz about an impending nuclear explosion. According to Orphan, they can't return to their jet since drones have already destroyed it. Sheesh, does everyone have hologram projectors in their gloves? Where do you get those, Best Buy? Grayson asks him to help, but he doesn't want to betray Mother, drawing his sword before Cass kicks it away. He's convinced this is just another test to prove his boss's idea that people can be better than what the world tries to make of them, even if that includes killing so-called imperfect children. A throwing blade meant for Harper's face is stopped by Cassie's palm, and Kane trades shots with Agent 37 before instructing security drones to kill everything they see. Bluebird has Cassandra take her to the central computer to shut down the attack drones, and maybe the nuke too, though more robots are ordered to pursue. Really? Suddenly she can't just tap on her smartphone to stop advanced technology she's encountering for the first time, just like she did in Batman Eternal? Was it charging in Grayson's jet? Orphan talks smack about Batman, how he never stopped lying, whereas Mother never lied in the first place, allegedly. Even when they crashed that chemical plant on a mission Kid Grayson was allegedly running, Crane was biding his time, and he was more ally than enemy. Flash back to the Dark Knight meeting the gun-wielding Johnny Strawbridges, who says Mother is dangerously insane but has only joined her for the sake of his work. What he's done in Prague, he thinks will shape the psychiatric understanding of fear for generations to come, maybe leading to entire new fields of study, which he bases on how the GCPD brought in Hugo Strange to study his toxins' effects. You know, just like when Batman Eternal mentioned that Alfred worked in the theater alongside pre-Clayface Basil Carlo, these... Name drops don't really have much of a point. They give the illusion that there's this great big destiny, world-building, interconnection nonsense, but it just makes the world that much smaller. It does not improve anything. Utilizing the visual aid of a holographic brain not projected from someone's wrist, what a novelty, Mumsy's deep pockets enabled Crane to develop trauma toxin which replicates chemicals the human body would to an event terrible enough to shred one's mind. She wants enough to gas every major city on Earth and shape the children as she sees fit. However, Crane isn't interested in victims that won't feel anything Mother doesn't want them to, particularly fear, and knows that once he's finished, Orphan will be sent to do away with him. That hasn't happened already because Crane is also tasked with compiling a psych profile on old pointy ears. Crane surrenders, suggesting some punches to make it look good, but the Dark Knight refuses. So the hologram changes to Robin trying to disarm the bomb, with Crane threatening to detonate it, leaving the kid comatose for the remainder of his days. But Batman approaches the villain while pulling a classic BECAUSE I'M BATMAN that kinda stretches the imagination. He'd apparently disarmed the bomb that morning on top of knowing Crane's location for weeks, 
waiting for him to be of use. The only way he'll send Scarecrow back to Gotham is to give Mother her report, with whatever info Bats wants in it. You work for me now! I know it sounds scary, but you get a 401k and a good dental plan. Because, you know, all the teeth I'm going to punch out of you. Seriously, though, this kind of thing has been done before, with the hero revealing they'd been on to some nefarious plot all along, but this feels like the usual convenience of this series. Maybe if they'd included a flashback panel of Batman figuring things out, it would flow better. With 9 minutes and 98 seconds to go, yeah, I don't know how that works, Cassie is fighting off the last of the drones while Bluebird works at the computer, but the Uber hacker is locked out. There's a jet they could use, but not without Kane's eye signature. Again, someone who instantly adapted to other people's tech with her smartphone can't get them out of this one. She starts getting emotional, believing she's about to die and realizing too late how that might affect her brother. Cass tells her they'll live, and Harper responds that she's sorry for what the girl was made to do, saying it doesn't matter since she tried doing the right thing in the end, and Harp is glad they met. Wow. A humanizing moment for a character that had previously been, basically, handed every skill, trait, and victory up to now. Unfortunately, it's far too little and way too late. The Eternal Books have unnaturally favored Roe far too much at this point for this to feel like anything more than a desperate saving throw to make her seem less of a writer's pet. And it falls very, very short, especially when you consider how many characters got stepped on by her along the way. They decide they'll go out fighting as more machines approach, then suddenly turn off. Grayson, battered and bloody, managed to take Orphan down with the bottled rage towards his mentor, followed by a tranquilizer, and then used his controls to stop the bots. He battles something about how their enemies think they're blinded by an easily shattered perception of Batman as perfect, but Grayson knows his strengths and weaknesses were that he was just human. Hey, remember that plot point from Batman Eternal? Let's use it again, but as a slightly smaller plot point in this story! Isn't that just the most original idea ever? They get to a working jet, escaping the explosion and heading for Spiral Headquarters, with Grayson stating there shouldn't be any more secrets. And note the distressed look on Cassandra's face. You have every right to be afraid, Cassandra. Your awful reinvention isn't over. There is plenty more idiocy on the way. Issue number 15. Uh, hey, are Azrael and Red Robin fighting or messing up an overly complex cheer routine? Well, anyway, the script is by Jackson Lanzig and Colin Kelly, and opens with a bare-faced Azrael hover meditating on how reality is a veil to a greater truth. The world is pure deception, and he's the only purity in it. So he's like Harper Rowe, but more subtle? Anyway, he starts fighting holograms of Red Rob and Red Hood, who had defeated him in Santa Prisca, and tried to deceive him. A dramatic voice, however, tells him his penance is not yet over. As Jean-Paul opens a book to some glowing smoke and symbols rising out, he notes his opponents and their stolen technology are a mile out, heading toward the city of Gnosis, their most holy site. Donning his helmet, as heads for a rematch that may yet redeem him. The writers on these books have shown they're not very good at character building. So when it comes to their idea of redemption, let's just say I haven't much faith. Tim has traversed the desert, dragging along Red Hood, whom he claims to have incapacitated. Yeah, I believe him. Jason is really, really annoying. Apparently, the retconned prodigy's mind was opened by the wrath of God, thanks to Azrael, and wants to join the Order of St. Dumas, giving Jason Todd as tribute. Really? Him? Just about anything would have made a better tribute, like a picnic basket full of expired cat food, or a moldy sponge. Though wanting to attack, Az is instructed by the ominous voice to accept Drake's offer, as all who seek knowledge are welcome. 
taken inside, Hood is waking up, so the monks use their fancy ornaments to relieve him of his gear, drop him in a hole, and shuts the metal door behind him. He counts down from 856, opens his ever-changing mask, and coughs up a tiny bat-shaped item, while Tim gets the grand tour. Jean-Paul says they're all scientists, seeking to prove and learn in their pursuit of the secret god. Oh, and they have a hawking pool, which I guess is impressive. The Order also don't see a point in procreating, seeing it as a flaw in biology that can result in knowledge being lost, and they can double or triple someone's lifespan. While Hood uses the tool to somehow bust open the doors to escape, and suddenly that hole doesn't seem as deep before, he... Wait, wait what? How did that happen? I mean, it couldn't have been a bomb because... The shockwave powerful enough to blast open those doors would have killed Jason. Though, on the other hand, I have no problem with that conceptually. Anyway, so, so, so how? Was it magnets? Double R is taken to meet their leader, power source, and guy who's aged really well for someone who was allegedly in the Crusades, Saint Dumas. While showing off how much he knows about the Bat Allies, he considers Tim the only true partner to Batman, and wants the teenager to become his new angel, which kind of irks the guy currently in that role. Tim isn't really interested though, but Wires McGillicuddy basically says, you'll be what I want you to be and like it. He isn't the first Dumas and hopes to be the last, and that Jean-Paul Valley's defeat has made him unworthy of being an unbeatable warrior. And in so many words, he's basically calling for a deathmatch. Okay, I can't stop asking questions of a book I know will never give answers. When he says he's not the first Dumas, is he saying there have been others since the Crusades? Or there were others from before? Years ago in Prague, Scarecrow is playing on the ledge of Mother's balcony, probably after she told him repeatedly not to, regaling her with the first profile he ever did for the Gotham Police on Batman. While his peers wrote him off as nuttier than an all-you-can-eat buffet for squirrels, Crane saw a man fighting his own terror and spreading his nightmare to others. Someone whose only fear was fear. Way to take FDR's speech so literally, Bruce. The profile is evolving, however, and Scarecrow sees a man that lost something. Despite efforts towards fearlessness, he's become afraid of losing Robin, Gotham, and fearful of Mother whom the unstable bat will eventually seek out. As Crane leaves, Orphan voices his distrust, given that the ichthys formula from Dumas is almost ready, with which they'll have no further need for either Batman or Scarecrow. Mother silences him, giving the order to take Crane to Cairo as she invites Wayne and prepares the child. In the Prague cave, Batman silently responds as Robin does some acrobatics training, referencing their fight from a few issues earlier, and saying he didn't care for how it ended. Batman says Crane's landed in Cairo, so they're getting the heck out of Prague. Oh, so that's the reconciliation. Leaving Prague to fight the Scarecrow in Egypt. Because earlier it felt like the fight was more of an afterthought. Okay, moving on. In the present, Hood battles monks and Tim takes on Azrael, while both count down this time in the double digits. Jason asks about Ichthys, and one monk reveals it's a programming algorithm for the brain, giving experience and direction. Then he bursts into flames. Cheery! When the Red's countdown ends, an electromagnetic pulse cripples the Order's facility, while Tim uses a capsule that traps Azrael in a quick hardening substance, and tries to convince him he was another subject of Mother's process, only for Dumas to confess he's kept that memory from Jean-Paul. You know, for a secret order, they sure do give up information left and right. Tim notes their mind tricks won't work on him. Maybe he's part hut, or toy Darian. When a disappointed Dumas uses his techno magic to knock the vigilante around from a distance, then redirects a stun gun back at him with the same power, and then suspends Drake in the air. Wait, why didn't you lead with that? With the stationary Azrael within earshot, Dumas further confesses his dealings with Mother, which led to the Angel's creation, 
that he's had to use the ominous voice from earlier to correct him ever since his defeat in Santa Prisca, intending to kill them both. As for Red Hood, who's trying to pry open a door, Dumas intends to use Ichthys to turn him into the new Azriel. Under the influence of the program, Jason sees himself reverted to his time as Robin, and face to face with the Joker. This is going to hurt you a lot more than it hurts me! He's probably talking to the readers. This story has been pretty painful to get through. Tune in next time, where it gets even more painful. Which I suddenly realize isn't much of a selling point.